Thank you so much, Daphne, for being here. And we're happy to hear your words of wisdom today. Well, thanks, Laura. And hey, thanks, everybody, for uh, jumping in. It's, it's great to virtually see all of you today. Um, I'm happy to be sharing some of my experience with regards to financing. And I think all of you know this is one of the key hurdles that you, you need to get through in launching your companies. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the kinds of financing, um, when you need it, what you do before, what you do to negotiate, just share some tips and pointers. Um, Laura gave you a bit of my background, but over the last couple of years, I've taken, um, I, I think at last count, six early stage companies through their first uh, investor financings. So um, have, have seen a lot of that. I have a pretty good feeling of what's market and what, what the venture community and other investors are looking for. And um, also, you know, helped companies with a bunch of non-dilutive financing as well, which we'll discuss. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's a negotiation always for these things uh, that, are, that are investor related. And I just um, say for those of you who come out of an academic uh, situation, I think one of the common misconceptions is, um, and, and I also was a, was a professor at one time, we sometimes think of the venture capital in the same way we think about grants. And we sometimes think of investors in the same way we think about program officers. And that's really not the right way to think about it. It's a, it's a business relationship. It's, it's very different. And, uh, you know, so I'll try and um, give you a little bit of insight into that. Um, before I launch this, though, um, it, hopefully it will work. Kathy has a little poll uh, that she wants to um, share with you where we're asking about your experience in raising money. And so I'm, I'm just going to ask you all to very quickly respond to that. And Kathy, can you activate that. Let's see if this technology works. Oh, okay. If, if people will click on the button that says polls, it should be on your Zoom menu right next to share screen. There's a question, have you raised capital before for your company? Yes or no, this is my first time. I just, I really would like to understand the experience of the audience here. If you will, we'll go ahead and fill that out. So far, we've got one person who's answered. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, sometimes it's difficult if people are on phones. It might be difficult to navigate to that screen. But okay, uh, but, okay. But yeah, we'll we'll keep it up for a little while. Okay. Well, actually, you know what? It says poll ended, so maybe we need to bring it. Well, back. how how about this? Um, is there? Uh, how about in the chat? If you are first timers. Would you just type yes in? I, I'm just curious if people, I want to make sure I'm aiming it the right way. Okay, we've got, I see at least a couple that are new. Great, great. Okay, so I'm going to start, you know, at, at the beginning, basically. And this is a, a topic that could take a lot of time um, to, to really drill into. So we're going to hit the highlights today. And then... Um, you know, there's opportunity, you can follow up with me, with people at Enterprise Works and so on if, if you have further questions. I'm going to share my screen. And if someone would tell me if you're actually seeing the slides. We can see the slides, Daphne. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. So firstly, um, this is an outline of what I'm going to talk about. And, and I do want to make this somewhat interactive. So I'll go quickly and then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, I'm going to give you some definitions. There's two kinds of way you bring money in. One is you sell stock, equity financing. The other is uh, you get money in for no stock, and we call that non-dilutive. Um, and then the equity side, there's really the traditional venture capital is, is the primary way. Um, that's to actually purchase shares in a round. There's a new technique out method out that uh, happened with the Jobs Act a few years ago called crowdsourcing. And then um, there's also sort of an in-between convertible instruments, and I'll explain what that is. 
Um, after we talk about those things, I want to share with you some of the key deal terms that you're going to see when you start getting proposals to finance your company. Um, go through a, a list of pros and cons of the different kinds of financing, and, and um, I want to you know, share with you my opinion for early stage companies of what the best routes are, and then ultimately a few tips and pointers. So um, starting with uh, equity. Often what companies will do is a priced equity round. And what that means simply is somebody says, I want to buy stock and it's going to be a price per share. I wanna buy stock in your company for a dollar a share. Um, the sources of that usually venture capital. And in that the investors will look at your company, they'll do diligence, and then they will make a proposal to you. And they'll say, we think the value is this today. We want to invest this amount. And we're going to do the math here, but that works out to X dollars per share. This is a kind of financing that's regulated by SEC rule Reg D. And the nice thing about this route is you're talking to very sophisticated, accredited investors. If they're institutions, um, they often, they will fall under that accreditation. Um, if they're a high net worth individual, there are certain financial standards they have to apply. But the reason I'm mentioning this is the assumption by the SEC is these people know what they're doing and they can afford to lose their money. And so there's a burden on them to do diligence, to ask the right questions, to understand the situation. And that really protects you. Um, you're going to always be truthful in what you say about your company. But if you make a forward-looking projection and say, gee, next year we hope to have revenue of a million dollars, these sophisticated individuals are viewed to be um, knowledgeable enough that they can assess the quality of that kind of claim. And they, under Delaware law, would have a hard time coming back at you and suing you for misrepresentation. Um, so that's the advantage of the Reg D kind of process, working with very um, experienced investors. Um, crowdsourcing opened investment up to the general public. These people um, can be non-accredited so just think of an average person that's got, you know, $3,000 to play with. Uh, that's what the crowdsourcing deal opened up. And so the SEC is much more protective of those kind of situations. And this um, crowdsourcing regulation allowed um, rounds to be solicited on the internet. But in doing that, you have to be actually factual about everything you say and not have forward-looking statements. So um, those are two kind of sources. Um, crowdsourcing on the internet can also be done aiming at the accredited investors under Reg 506C. Um, that brings some institutionals in. Uh, but, th but those are your basic ways to sell stock at a price per share. The other way to get money in, which I really like for early stage companies, is um, investors will bring in cash and it's an agreement with the company that they're going to purchase stock in the future. So they make a cash deposit with you. And then in the future, when you do a price round, they will convert their cash into stock at that time. Um, that is really nice because it brings some, some valuable cash into the company early. The company doesn't have to think about its valuation very hard early. Um, and, it, and it can use that cash to build value so that later when it does the price round, it can have a better valuation. Uh, there's two kinds of ways this cash comes in. One is called a convertible note. One is called a safe. And uh, safe has become extremely popular. And I'll, I'll explain why in a few minutes. Convertible notes are actually debt instruments. Um, it's like a lender giving you cash and that makes debt on your books. And in return for taking a risk with your company, you're going to say to them, okay, you can buy stock in the future in my company when I do the price round. But because you've come in early, 
you're going to get interest between now and when I do that round. You're also going to get a discount. And sometimes there's even a cap saying, if the valuation gets really big, you're going to buy stock less at a much lesser price uh, based on this cap. For safes, um, they're a different kind of mechanism, a different vehicle. They're not actually debt. And on your balance sheet, they'll show up in the equity side. They also come with a discount and a valuation cap. And, and that cap will set the maximum price per share. So those are your equity options. Um, the other way to bring cash in is non-dilutive. And I think you all are probably more familiar with this. Um, so you get grants. That's great. NSF doesn't take stock in your company. Um, Kickstarter sometimes brings in, you know, 20, 30, 50,000 to small companies. Um, there are lots of prizes and competitions. You see Enterprise Works will often inform you about these. Revenue is the very, very best non-dilutive financing because it convinces uh, future investors that it's a real business. You can get debt sometimes. So if you're um, getting good revenue and if your company is profitable, you can go to the bank and take out a loan. And uh, that's, that's a great way to do things. Low interest, you don't sell the bank equity. And then finally, there's another kind of debt called venture debt where uh, occasionally um, an investor will loan you money. Uh, they, that debt is secured against your IP, which means if you don't pay it back, they own your IP. <laughs> so there can be significant risk for a small company. And sometimes the venture debt holders also want to have equity as well. So those are your uh, generally your non-dilutive options. I'm going to pause. Um, I'm seeing some things come through in chat. If there are any uh, burning questions on those things, just um, write them up in chat and I'll try to address them as I go. Um, but I'm going to, um, excuse me, go, go forward in the talk here for a moment. So let's say that you've, um, you've decided you're going to go out and talk to venture capital. And um, you, you've got a pitch deck and you're talking to them about your company and what your business plan is and how you're gonna make money. And they decide they really like the opportunity and they're going to want to invest. And so the next step is to see if they would be the lead in the investment. Usually um, these deals are done with two or three venture firms coming together. Um, typically one doesn't want to take all the risks. So they like to share that risk with other investors. And what you need is somebody to lead the round. And so they will write a term sheet for you and, and it will lay out the basic um, concepts for their investment. So one of the key areas is economics. What's the total money in the round? Uh, what's the valuation? How's the money coming in? Is it coming in all at once at the beginning or will you have to get it in little pieces? Like, um, you know, they put a million dollars in and then you have to achieve a milestone. And if you achieve the milestone, they'll put another million. That's, that's called tranching. Um, they define the, the entire stock in the company, not just the stock that's issued to shareholders, but also stock that might be granted under a stock option pool. And um, there's also some terminology, and we can talk about this offline, but um, often the investors will be participating preferred, which means uh, when you sell your company, first step is they get their money back. Second step is they get paid the percentage of their ownership. But that is um, kind of an aggressive stance and a lot of others will have a choice. Either they are participating like that to get their, their funds back or they simply collect their pro rata percentage. And so that can make you know, some difference into how, how the payouts work at the end of the day. Um, we also see dividends being requested by some venture capital, although I, I'm seeing a lot fewer deals lately with dividends attached. And what that would be is uh, 
every year they get a percent, um, kind of like interest, and it accrues though until exit. So if they're getting 8% a year and it takes several years for you to exit, um, that could accrue to a, a big benefit to them. Um, they also get paid first. And sometimes you'll even see them say, okay, I'm going to get my money back times two. So if I've put 5 million in, I want 10 million right off the top. Um, so that can happen. So you need to think through the economics and you need to model this out. And really what I like to do is make a liquidation prep, uh, waterfall at the end that shows for each shareholder, how much would they uh, get as a gain um, based on a, an exit value. So we sell the company for a hundred million, this amount goes to investor one, this amount goes to investor two, this amount goes to founders. And if you can do that, that really helps you think about all these terms. Um, you know, sometimes people get really wound up in what percent ownership they have, but what really matters at the end of the day is, are you going to make money on your company and will the other people make enough money that they're excited about investing? The other key piece in a term sheet is control. Um, and this is, you know, the rights to make decisions, key decisions in the company. So venture capital comes in with preferred stock. Um, founders typically have common stock and the rights and the economics of the preferred are superior to common. There's also a defining in, in these term sheets of um, what is the board composition. Often these small companies will have five board members. It's pretty typical that there will be two for the preferred stock, two for the common stock, one of which is the CEO, and there will be a fifth position that's mutually agreed. That's, that's a very standard composition that I see. There are a lot of other rights that are in there, protective provisions for the investors that basically say, hey, if you wanna go do these things, you have to have our approval. And some of those things are sell the company, raise more capital, take out a lot of debt, uh, completely change your line of business. You know, the, those sorts of things are there to protect their rights. They also have a right to participate in future rounds. And then finally, the term sheet will define a process. How long do they think it will take before you can close the round? What are the check marks that they have to make before they're fully committed? Like they have to do diligence, they have to find other followers to come in on your round. Um, maybe there's some things that you have to fix before they're willing to come in. And, and lastly, they don't want you taking their term sheet and sharing it with others. So there's often a exclusivity provision there. Okay, um, I'm gonna switch gears from the venture capital process and talk about crowdsourcing. So this is the internet you know, way to, to go raise some money. Um, I'm not a big fan of this. I'll, ju I'll just say outright, it sounds appealing. But in talking to several CEOs who have done it, it sounds like more pain than it's worth. Um, in this, the company writes a term sheet as opposed to investors. So you set the price for your company, uh, but under the SEC laws, um, the amount you can raise is capped. So if you have your financial statements reviewed by an outside auditing firm, you're allowed to raise a little more than a million. If you have your financial statements actually audited by, by an outside accounting firm, then you can raise up to five million. And in this, um, as I said before, an individual can invest as little as $100 in this, in this uh, opportunity. But what uh, these are run through broker dealers that take all those little investors and aggregate them into a single LLC. WeFunder is a typical uh, kind of group that does these. And when you have all those individual investors aggregated, then the company gets to pick one of them that will be the lead. And sometimes you'll see institutionals pr participating. So the company might pick a, a, you know, an impact fund or a family office, and that would be the lead for that group. And, and that group will have rights to vote on certain things. Um, you can offer preferred stock, you can offer common stock. 
and you can give more rights. Um, if you give more rights, then the institutionals might jump on this. If you don't, then you're probably dealing with individuals. The uh, thing that's kind of not attractive is you can't be doing this and a venture capital financing at the same time. So you have to fully close down the uh, crowdsourcing route if you want to start a regular VC kind of process. And I said before that everything is tr must be truthful. The other thing is all your information is public. So the financial statements you show will be on the internet. Any information about your uh, commercial path, your commercial plans, um, you know, that again, not forward looking, but that will be on the internet for the whole world to see. So you need to think about that. It's kind of like being public when, when you're very small as a company. Um, and it's a lot of work because questions come in from these investors and you have to every week respond to them and your responses are also public. And because they are not sophisticated investors, the kinds of questions you get are not at the level that you see with venture capital. And, and you know, basically sometimes it's a real headache to deal with questions that are not highly relevant. Okay, so I'm switching now to the convertible instruments. Um, as I said before, there are safes, there are convertible notes, and I really like safes. These were developed by Y Combinator, a group in California that just felt that small companies were spending a lot of time and energy um, on legal costs. And so there are standard forms that are available online. They've been tested and used by hundreds and hundreds of companies at this point. You can just download them and use those safe instruments for your business. So you don't need to hire a lawyer to do that. Um, the investors that come into safes are angels or venture capital. And the advantage of doing this, as I said before, is you, you're delaying pricing the company until the future. Um, but all of these safes, when you, when you do ultimately do a price round, they convert into stock and that conversion is mandatory. So people are not allowed to say, hey, I don't like that round or I don't want to do this. Uh, they become equity at the time you do your, your price round. And one of the neat things is if your company does go bust, um, you don't have to do anything here except distribute the remaining cash assets. On convertible notes, you often get pulled into kind of a bankruptcy process because it's truly debt. And someone has to look at the debt and, and the other obligations of the company and decide who gets paid first. Safes are, are much less uh, hassle free or much more hassle free um, when uh, when things go bad. And the investors that are coming in know that they know that they don't have any security um, really on on this uh, investment and, and they expect a certain number of them to fail. For convertible notes, I, I recommend legal review because these are um, much more serious documents. They're less standardized and um, you know, usually what's coming in is institutional investors in this, um, sometimes angels, same kind of mandatory conversion. Um, and as I said before, it's a debt instrument accruing interest. It's on your balance sheet. They also have a maturity date. Usually uh, these notes will say, I need to be paid back within a year. <laughs> and most people will renegotiate that payback, but they really are trying to put pressure on the company to get a price round done. And so that, that makes it hard because sometimes it can take longer than a year to, to get things ready. And, and every time you have to go back to your convertible note holders and renegotiate, they can change the terms, they can increase the interest, they can do all sorts of things. Okay, so this is probably one of the more helpful parts to just kind of sum it up. And what I'm gonna ask is let's, let's read horizontally on this. And I've put the different kinds of options here and my opinion as to what's more favorable, less favorable of all of these. So if you need a lot of money, you know, let's say you need 15 million, you probably are looking at venture capital in a price round. 
um, on safes and convertibles, it's hard to raise a lot more than say, you know, five to 10 million, four to 10 million. Um, the nice thing is we often see in safes that very small investors, you know, 25K or something will come in on those. So, so that's possible. Crowdsourcing, it's hard to raise a lot. And so, you know, as I said before, 200K, you often see a lot of companies try this and they'll, they'll get 50K, 100K. You know, it's, it's not a great uh, amount of money for the work it takes. In terms of the investors being um, really focused and helping the company and wanting to roll up their sleeves and work with the company, um, that happens most in a venture capital round. They're taking a board seat. They've got a fiduciary duty. They're really focused on you. When they come in on safes and convertibles, there, it's much more arm's length. Uh, they don't really have a lot of control in those deals. And, um, you know, they, uh, they basically are putting money in to have a future opportunity to invest in the company. Um, and, and in terms of, uh, excuse me, the, um, the crowdsourcing, there the investors aren't really engaged at all. It's just the general public, but you do have to give them public updates. And um, going to the next row, how much work is required? So um, good here means the least work for the company. The least work for the company is, is the safe. You, as I said before, you don't need to hire attorneys. Um, investors will want some diligence. They'll want to talk to you. They'll want to see a deck, maybe a data room. Bit more work to do a convertible note. A lot more work to do a venture capital round and the most work to do the crowdsourcing. So that's just qualitatively what I see as the difference. In terms of how easy is it to get it, probably easiest to get a convertible note done Safes are also quite easy, much harder for the crowdsourcing and much harder for the VC. And then an impact on the founders, how much are you getting diluted? How, how much of your company are you giving up? You'll give up the most with the VC round. Um, and uh, crowdsourcing, you can also, in, in fact, affect yourself a lot. But because the safes and convertibles um, you know, leave that valuation out into the future, it's, it's less dilutive typically. And then lastly, in terms of control, safe holders don't really have any control of the company. Um, uh, of course, the public doesn't have control, but the VCs do. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a pros and cons situation where um, if you need the money, you're willing to do the work and you're willing to give up the control and have people engage in helping you run your company, then VCs are ex absolutely the thing to do. If you're at an earlier stage where you still need to have a lot of impact, you don't want much dilution, you don't have time to do a lot of work, it's early days, um, you might wanna go with a safe or a convertible note, uh, but you're gonna raise less money that way. I have a couple questions coming in, so I'm going to pause for a moment. Someone said, explain where angel investors come into this and um, could they be the same uh, as part of these options? So um, maybe angel adding on to that, Daphne, if there's an angel group, sometimes they're coming together as an aggregate group, as a special right. purpose vehicle, something like that. Okay, so uh, there's traditional venture capital, which draws its funds from limited partners who are often pension funds, high net worth individuals, university endowments, um, you know, corporations, and they build a fund and, and the venture capital general partners go out and deploy that money by investing in companies. Angels are investing from their own wallet, from their own checkbook. And they're often very high net worth individuals, very sophisticated. So you can treat them much in the same way you would think about the VCs. Um, sometimes it is harder to manage because there's a lot of people uh, involved and each one of them wants access to the CEO. So it's better if you're working with a large number of angels that they actually form 
a special purpose vehicle. And one of those angels is the spokesperson that contacts the company, as opposed to you having to keep 20 different people updated. So, so be careful there. As long as angels come in on safes and convertibles, I haven't seen a lot of problems. Where I have seen problems is when angels try to price around and usually their idea of valuation is very different than investor, you know, venture capital valuations. And then if the angel is actually in your board or has some control rights, they can make it hard to get the next round of money in. So I think it's um, most ideal if the angels are coming in as safes and convertibles and are supportive of the company, uh, but don't impede a, a venture capital process down the road. Okay. Um, well, one more, if I might, Daphne, on this yes. pros cons. Um, there are many that look at accelerators or may participate in multiple accelerators, which tend to have a limited amount of money and some equity stake, maybe access to investors and other um, potential positive pros. But can you think about that in the scope of this chart as well? Okay, so accelerators often claim, you know, we're going to run a boot camp for you and we're going to teach you how to run a company. And in return for that, we're going to get a piece of your equity. So I would, if I were doing this, I would look really hard and understand what they're offering. And if it's worth that amount of equity, you can often get the same services with service providers, advisors, consultants, and you can get it for a lot less equity. Or you also can get often a higher quality service because some accelerators just use standard templates and push them at you and don't really um, customize what they do for your company. So, um, you know, Word of caution, you know, they'll send lots of uh, announcements out and, you know, $100,000 available. <laughs> um, so it sounds appealing, uh, but, but just the cautionary note is how many strings are attached, what do they get, and how much do you have to give to get them in? Okay, and, and these are my opinions, guys. Different people may have different points of view. So now in the last little bit, I'm going to talk about um, just some tips, pointers here. I, I think a lot of small companies try to raise capital too soon. And there's, they find themselves sitting in front of venture capitalists, other investors, without clarity on what is their company doing and how is their company going to make money. And you, that's a situation you never want to be in. You, you don't want the investor in their mind to be thinking, wow, these guys don't know what they're doing, but there's good technology. I can get in cheap and I can run it. <laughs> you know, that, that is a venture capitalist, uh, sometimes ideal situation because a lot of them know management teams they can put in. Um, so you, you want to have your ducks in a row, basically, before you go out and talk to people. And some of the key things you need to have, what's your product strategy, what's your go-to-market plan, what's your business model? And by that, I mean, have a five-year pro forma that shows how much revenue you're going to make, what it's going to cost you. You need to fully have thought through your budget. Um, don't engage until you're ready. It's, it, it will be a very costly experience if you're not ready. And, and in fact, most really good venture capitalists don't want to engage you until you're ready because it's just too much work for them if, if you're not there yet. Um, the pro forma model you build will tell you how much cash you need. So, you know, um, this is a point I made before about don't think of this like grants. You know, if you get a, a government grant for $2 million, that's a lot better than a grant for 1 million. And if you get a 5 million grant, that's amazing. <laughs> um, same cannot be said about, about raising capital from investors. You want to take enough to comfortably get you through 18 to 24 months, but don't just uh, pile on more money, um, you know, just, just because it's offered, because uh, they're getting in at a lower price. It's better to take the money you need get through the 18 to 24 months, build value, and then raise again. So people will do a series A, a series B, and so on. Um, 
With regard to getting um, valuation and the investors again will propose the valuation, really focus on how this is a business. I think a lot of uh, us coming out of academic technology field, we love our science. We think everyone should love our science. We wanna talk about our science. They wanna hear, how will I make money? <laughs> you know, in the, the most blunt way I can say it. You need to say to them, I've got a unique technology and here's how it will make money for this company. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, technical ways from the performer, they can think about what the company will earn over time and how much that is worth today. Um, one of the key considerations is how much cash is really needed to keep this company running until it makes enough revenue that it can stand on its own feet. Um, no investor wants to come in with too little cash and then the company crashes. So they're very cautious about, you know, how, what is our capital raising strategy over time until we get to cash flow positive? And can this company raise that money over time? And, and that will tell them the overall risk because they don't want to lose their entire investment. Um, they look at recent deals in the space. What, what were those priced at? How unique is the IP? What team competence is high on the list for evaluation? And of course, you can drive your price up if you've got a lot of investors that want, you know, that are all elbowing each other out to try and get in the deal. Um, on team, competency matters a lot. It, it needs to start, it needs to feel like a real company, professionals. And it's really not, if, if they get a feeling that it's about the founder ego in all of this, um, it's gonna make them very concerned. Um, you want to have real experienced business leaders, a real board. Um, generally, if academic founders are controlling, it's, it's a concern for people. And then um, lastly, you need a decent data room, um, clean up any mess you have around IP, any other issues so that when you go out and the investors are looking at your information, they're not discovering problems. You've already found your own problems and you've solved them. Okay, this I believe is my last one. So let's say wonderful thing happens, you get that term sheet. Um, what you have to do is choose your battles. Think about a couple items you wanna push back on um, and be willing to horse trade. You, you give a little, they give a little, get to a position where you wanna be. You can, um, you have a phone call for clarification, but don't negotiate in that moment. Uh, take all that information in and then thoughtfully send back a red line. And in this, you would probably be working with your counsel to, to red line that unless you've got a lot of experience on it. Um, and, and you wanna send them kind of a one and done. Red line it so that if all these things are fixed, I'm ready to sign this deal. <laughs> that's, that's what you wanna do. Um, I would say don't get too hung up on valuation. What really matters is at the end of the day, are you going to make enough money that you're happy? And does this investment that's coming in make it more likely for your company to get an exit with a higher value? Um, I wouldn't worry too much about control as long as it's balanced among different individuals. And if you put the board in those protective provisions, the board members have to serve their fiduciary duty, not the duty to their investor and firm. Um, I think also if the founders haven't been in business, having the founders appoint a board member uh, to be in that boardroom is really important. You know, boards usually vote unanimously and what makes decisions happen is the influence within the boardroom. And so if you have someone really experienced, that person can't exert very much influence. So you want to make sure that you, you have that in there. Um, as I said before, common shareholders will lose control and you need to be ready to accept that. Um, you also want to make quick decisions. If you've got a term sheet you like, get that thing closed as fast as you can. Um, no surprises in the data room and experienced legal counsel, ideally someone who routinely closes uh, financing deals with investors on the coast, because most people follow either Silicon Valley or, or the East Coast. And so that is it. We have quite a bit of time for um, conversation now. 
And I, um, I see a couple things here in the um, chat. One thing was, um, do I have any pointers on how to identify potential angels? What I like to do is look at companies in the, the general space uh, of your company and look for situations where companies have exited recently and where the founders in those companies likely made a really good windfall. Um, they're going to be uh, flush with cash and they know the space and they understand the problem you're solving. Um, those are really great angels to have. They're, they're the most value added because they really can understand your business and they can help you. So that, that would be my number one uh, pointer for going after an angel. Um, okay, we can uh, open the mic up. Um, I think you all have the ability to, to talk if you unmute, um, or we can continue with chat. Um, Maybe jumping on the angel topic, just once more, Daphne, with that, there are angel groups. You've had yes. some in the region. What's the utility of that as a mechanism to find angel investors versus what you just said is a perfect scenario, but um, what, what are your thoughts on angel groups? I haven't had good luck with those angel groups because they usually like to follow VCs. Um, they often really, um, they apply a deeper diligence often than an early stage company merits. You know, it, if uh, uh, another way to say that is sometimes it's analysis paralysis. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, uh, I think the culture of the group matters a lot. And there's only been a few that I've, I've experienced, um, but I haven't been happy and I've never consummated anything with any of them. So again, my opinions doesn't doesn't mean it's uh, the rule. And I don't know if everyone on here, um, you know, there may be some local angels on the line who who want to challenge that. But um, I, I've I've just seen, um, you know, you pitch to a group of angels and then you get dozens and dozens of questions, a lot irrelevant. Some are, you know, kind of. Um, almost like following business school basics because they don't understand the space or the technology. And it's really hard for them as a group to get a, you know, get a consensus and come online and, and invest. And ultimately um, a couple of times I've done it, they've just said, hey, let us know when you got a lead and we'd be happy to follow for a hundred thousand dollars or something like that, you know? So, and then the leads uh, who are, you know, bona fide VCs usually don't want that. So it's, it can be challenging. We've got a question about the value cap for a safe. How do you yeah. price that? Oh, I, I would ask the lead investor to propose it. And, and ideally you've got two or three that you're courting and you can see what terms you're getting from all of them. So a little bit like the term sheet process. Um, you also can get a sense of your valuation. If you've got a decent pro forma, um, you can just simply look at the EBITDA line over the next five years. I mean, it's largely not highly grounded in an early company, but you can look at what you think your sales will be, what your costs will be, what your net is and then do a net present value on the company. The other way you can take a look is um, you can uh, look at what other recent deals were and um, kind of what valuation those other companies got on their first round. And that information is hard to get, but if you have a friend in the venture capital community, there's databases that sometimes help with that. It's sort of a, you want the market to tell you. This is, this is the basic thing is, you know, when someone says, what's your valuation? You say, we're looking to the market. We're interested in hearing what the market thinks. And that tells them that you're talking to people and um, you're going to get some proposals. Daphne, we've got several companies on here and they can jump on that have gotten SBIR funding. And you mentioned non-diluted funding in the beginning. How do you yeah. think about pairing non-dilutive funding such as SBIR with other sources of funding and investors? Look, you, you should be trying to get grants all the time, all the time. 
raise raise any non dilutive that comes along. It's investors love to see it. They're not highly impressed with it, frankly. Um, you know, so I think sometimes uh, founders uh, will say, "Hey, I got this really big grant," and they're you know, this, well, that's nice. I'm glad you're doing that. Um, so uh, just just keep doing it. You know, that's that's um, money without giving up equity is is super valuable as long as the mission of the grant is highly aligned with your business. You don't want to get grants just to get grants that are unrelated. That's a distraction. But if it's aligned with the business, by all means. A little bit off topic, but there was a private question about slicing up early ownership of the company and advice you might have for this of equity splits as the company evolves and makes further strides. Okay, I'm not understanding that question. I'm kind of scrolling back in the chat to see if I can see it, but I'm not seeing it. Um, Ownership I, structure of early equity. This might be founders, early employees versus investors. Right. Still not quite understanding what the question is. Um, so, I mean, it's it's it kind of goes like this. If your company is valued at four million today, and an invest, I'm, I'm making the math simple. An investor puts one million in. Then after that million comes in, the value of your company is five million, and that investor would get twenty percent ownership. In a very simple worldview, um, so the remaining eighty percent would be um, amongst the founders and and the employees. And it's very common that people like to see in the stock option pool somewhere between ten and fifteen percent of the companies fully diluted cap equity is um, in stock options. Uh, the rest would be for common shareholders, original founders, people who you know, maybe did a bit of friends and family investment on, the, on day one, uh, that kind of thing. Does, does that answer it for whoever asked that question? This is Lori, it was me. Um, I was telling Laura in a private message that I'm often asked by um, our tech startup companies when I'm doing EIR appointments with them, questions about how to structure ownership, equity at the early stages with teams. Mm -hmm. They may need a developer to come on board and they want to, to motivate that developer. Yeah. Um, and, and there's just always a lot of questions about what sort of decisions you make early, how those decisions will impact when you go to get funding later, but also the things that change very quickly in terms of who's really invested. So, yeah. Um, if that's so, was about. yeah. So the when venture capital comes in, I don't think they care if you've overcompensated a developer or undercompensated a developer. What they want to see is that there's enough stock option pool available to now do fresh stock option grants to the people who really matter in the company. Um, for founders of companies, the least problematic is just an even split. If there are four of you, you each have 25%. But um, it often is the case that some people do more, some people do less. And um, there's a lot of discussion of this in the internet. Um, we don't have time to go on today, but People can make agreements that um, with each other that, look, you're going to commit this and you're going to do this. And if you don't, your ownership will go down. It's important to hammer that out early amongst the core founders. And then when you bring on service providers, employees, consultants, there's kind of a standard rule of thumb of what percentage they get. Um, so those, those are more compensation issues. And I really don't see investors worried too much about, you know, if you decided you needed to give somebody 5% of your company just to do some work, well, that's, that's your deal. You know, it's, uh, it, it doesn't really matter for the investor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're, we're at about five minutes, so we can take 
one or two last questions, or I will just turn it over to Laura. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's a little hard in this forum to for people to step up and ask questions, but I appreciate the the comments in the chat. That's very helpful. There's a lot in the private chat you're not seeing, Daphne. So I'll say that people might be more comfortable talking one on one. So on her slide here you can send her an EIR request. So our entrepreneurs and residents are a great resource and can consult you, can be an independent advisor if you're already working with investors and you want another opinion or you're evaluating options, please consider talking to Daphne before you make further commitments or another one of our EIRs you just saw Lori on as well. And different EIRs have different areas of expertise, but as you can see, Daphne's very well educated in different funding options and has a lot of great opinions to offer and true experience from her own work. So take advantage of that and sign up online. Well, and, and good luck, everybody. You know, um, one of the advice I often give to founders is um, just like a lot of things, you've got to kiss a lot of frogs and ultimately you'll find the right the right prince in the mix. So it's often just a matter of perseverance and finding an investor that's right for you. So um, good luck. <laughs>